Coming up in this episode, we'll tell you all about the books that we've been reading recently, including titles from Avon Gale, Piper Vaughn, Chase Ellis, and a lot more. Welcome to episode 267 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. I'm Jeff Adams, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knauss. Hello, everyone. As always, the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. If you'd like more information about the bonus content we offer to our patrons, go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Hello, Rainbow Romance readers. Welcome back. We are so glad that you could join us for this episode. 2020 has been pretty unrelenting in numerous ways, but I want to take a quick moment to thank everyone who wished me a happy birthday on social media. Your kindness and well wishes are definitely appreciated. One way that I've managed to get through not only my birthday, but the last couple of weeks has been, of course, reading. My favorite pastime. One of the books that has been on my bedside table for a couple of weeks now is Dolls, 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 Deep Inside Valley of the Dolls, the most beloved bad book and movie of all time by Stephen Ribello. Now, if there's any author who is going to write a definitive behind-the-scenes look at the book and movie, it's Stephen Ribello. He is the guy who, along with his co-writer, penned the life-altering tome Bad Movies We Love which was based on the column that appeared in Movie Line magazine way back in the 90s. This book was important to me in so many ways, and it also laid my foundation of my love for the movie Valley of the Dolls. And in this book, Stephen takes a look at Jackie Suzanne and the writing and promotion of the book itself and how that led to that bestseller's journey to Hollywood all the the behind-the-scenes shenanigans that went on in the making of the film, its disastrous premiere and critical lambasting, although it was a really big hit, everyone loved it, and in the intervening years since its release, its elevation to true cult status. I really love this book, filled with so many juicy backstage stories, and it offers so many layers about what went on with this particular property. It was really wonderful. A total breeze to read because of all the interviews that he collected for this book. Tons of fascinating stories. I realize that this might be of limited interest to listeners of this particular show, but I loved it to pieces and I highly recommend Dolls, Dolls, Dolls by Stephen Rabello. Now in episode 266 of the podcast, we spoke with author Jace Ellis and her newest book, Learned Behaviors, just came out. I had a chance to read an advanced copy of this and I was head over heels in love with it. In the story, Jack has just gotten his daughter packed off to college when he gets a message from his boss, Patty Kingsley. Their home and lifestyle brand has just landed a huge account, but Bernhardt wants a holiday exclusive in their stores in time for Black Friday. Matt, arriving at the Kingsley offices in D.C., will be acting as sort of the on-site liaison for Bernhardt, and he's there to make sure that the development of the new product line stays on schedule. The stress and accelerated timeline for the project has Matt and Jack butting heads. They're driving each other nuts, but that doesn't mean that they can't also be attracted to each other. And after working together for a while, you know, putting out fires and slowly moving the project forward, they develop a sort of grudging respect even though neither one of them knows how to deal with the sexual tension that is building between them. Jack visits his daughter on Parents Weekend, and they hang out with Tanisha's friend Angela and her dad, who just so happens to be Matt. At dinner, the dads catch the vibe that Tanisha and Angela might be more than just friends, and it's during this visit that Jack learns Matt needs to be at his son's wedding on the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, which is, of course, the launch date that they're struggling so hard to meet. Jack takes Matt to a Bernhard store to get a wedding gift, and they almost kiss in the bedding department, wanting to give in to their attraction. The restraint, however, doesn't last very long. They share a scorching hot kiss in the parking lot. Then, working late one night, Matt finds Jack in his office, He's tense and he needs some release, if you know what I mean. Matt takes charge, telling Jack exactly what he wants and how he wants it, and Jack 
happily obliges. It's amazing, mind-blowing, and it opens up a lot of possibilities for them, maybe even relationship possibilities. But when Jack gets home that night, he unexpectedly finds Tanisha there, her heart broken by Angela. And he does his best to soothe her, but this definitely complicates things between him and Matt. But Jack's mom assures him that he does in fact deserve to have a life too. When he finally finds himself in Matt's bed, he is not disappointed. Again, totally mind-blowing. He knows what he feels, but what does it mean and how would he and Matt work out in the long run? I mean, it's definitely not casual, and they spend the rest of the week improving that to one another. On Monday morning, though, everything completely falls apart. Bernhardt has rejected their current design, but the nepotistic fool who's playing office politics behind the scenes is not in the same league as Matt, and he does not suffer fools lightly. Once that nonsense is shut down, he goes all the way to Norfolk, where his son's wedding prep has hit a snag. And once he has that under control, he tells his family that there is a new man in his life. So add another plus one to the guest list. The wedding on Thanksgiving weekend arrives, and Jack manages to temporarily seduce Matt away from his work, adding some playtime to the hectic days ahead, days that Matt unfortunately spends almost entirely on his phone and his laptop. And having to go it alone at a wedding that he's not even a part of has Jack rethinking some things. On the morning of the big day, they are finally able to talk about Matt's lack of work-life balance, but then Jack gets a phone call. Tanisha has had an asthma attack that has landed her in the hospital. So Jack packs to leave. Matt gets dressed for his son's wedding. No matter how much they might want to be there for each other, family always comes first. Now, Tanisha is fine and assures her dad that he doesn't need to drop everything for her like when she was a baby. And the wedding goes well, but... When Angela sees her dad without Jack by his side because of a family emergency, she puts two and two together, and soon father and daughter are headed back to D.C. to be with that other father-daughter pair that they are undoubtedly both in love with. The week after the launch, which by the way was very successful, Patty gives Jack a much-deserved promotion. At the same time, Matt has decided that he is done with Bernhardt, to have given them so much for so long and have so little to show for it. I mean, the choice is clear. With some help and encouragement from their friends and family, each of our heroes come to realize now that their children are grown, they might finally be able to start a new chapter. Jack takes Tanisha to the office Christmas party, which Patty has decorated in the finest of holiday style. And she takes to the stage to thank her team when she is joined by a surprised guest. It's Matt. And when he and Jack finally have a moment alone together, they dispense with the mea culpas. They were both wrong. They were both right. And then they get it on like men half their age. I mean, seriously, it's explosive heat when these two are together. Everyone is supportive of them, and Jack and Matt are able to move forward as a couple and as a newly integrated family. Oh, guys, everything about learned behaviors was so deeply satisfying to me like as a reader. The way Jace Ellis has created these two men, they're complex characters who have such interesting, compelling lives and how they navigate all of that in their attempt at romance, all the while generating so much heat. It's just, it's really good stuff. And combine all that with some really delicious tropes. You've got enemies to lovers, an office romance, and hot dads. I mean, ugh, it got, it's just way too irresistible. I fell really hard for Jack and Matt, and I feel pretty confident in saying that out of everything that I've read so far this year, these two are one of my favorite couples. And I haven't even really had a chance to mention some of the really amazing secondary characters that help them on their journey towards Happily Ever After. Jack's mom is funny and amazing and wise. Matt's ex-wife seems a little daunting at first, but she just wants what's best for Matt, and that is clearly Jack. And then there's also Jack's group of single dad friends who help and support each other. I'm really looking forward to their stories as well. So I really recommend this book. Jace Ellis knows how to write a hell of a good romance, and I hope that you'll check this out. Oh, and I wouldn't necessarily categorize this as a Christmas story per se, but it does take place during the holiday season. So I think now is the perfect time to read Learned Behaviors. Look at you sneaking in a holiday-esque story right there at the beginning of the season, even though that's not really what it is. I'm so glad you enjoyed that. I know you loved Andre, and 
I'm eager to read some of Jace's work as well. Yeah, I hope everyone will give her a shot. So I have four books to talk about. And these four are all extremely different from each other. And I'm going to kick it off with T.J. Clune's brother song. So it's news to no one who listens to this show that I'm a big fan of the Green Creek series and of TJ's. This series is truly one of the best I've ever read with its sweeping story about the Bennett werewolf pack from Green Creek, Oregon. I was swept away within the first chapters of Wolf Song a couple of years ago, and there's been no looking back since then. TJ created compelling characters, incredible love stories where these characters had to fight through hell and back for their mate, and there's a huge battle of good and evil stretching across the series. Now, with the fourth book, Brother Song, the saga wraps up, and it was an incredible and perfect finale for the series. It's always a little scary when a beloved series wraps up. I think we've all suffered through less than satisfying endings in book series and in TV series. TJ did it right, though. If there's never, ever another Bennett Pack story, and, and he said that'll be the case, I am forever satisfied with where Brother Song leaves these people, the ones that they love and the citizens of Green Creek. Brother Song is the first time we've had a book from the point of view of a member of the Bennett Pack. Through Carter Bennett's eyes, we get some meaningful points of history, an in-depth look at his father, and we get to watch him fall hopelessly in love for the guy he's been drawn to. Now, since I'm not going to go into too many details, I'm going to focus solely on what I love here, and I'm going to try and not be too obtuse as I do so. Carter and Gavin's love story is absolutely beautiful. It's been brewing for quite a while through the series, and it's always been difficult for them. In Brother Song, declarations of love are made, and for both of them, this is not easy. Gavin's been through hell, and he's done most of that alone. Carter's had his fair share of hell, too, but he's had his family and pack around him. Still, he's got to find it in himself to give his heart to another, and he never thought it would be a man, either. TJ doesn't put a label on whether Carter is bi or pan or something else. What really matters here is that Carter devotes his everything to Gavin. Being in Carter's head as he sorts all of it out of what Gavin means to him really gave me all the feels. Now, found family, of course, is central to Green Creek books and really central to most of TJ's writing, and it plays such a huge role here. With the perspective of a Bennett, We learn so much about the pack and the members that have joined over the years. We get glimpses of the Bennets before the events in Wolf Song. Most importantly, though, we see how the pack rallies around each other in a way we've never seen before. The middle section of this story is essentially one big love letter to all things pack as everyone reconnects. And Carter leans on his family to help him figure out what's going on with him and Gavin. We even get a glimpse of Christmas time. See, I've got my own little Christmas bit going on here, too. Tis the season. (laughs) Indeed. I could have lived inside this part of the book for many, many more chapters, relishing in what makes the Bennett Pack the Bennett Pack. Like I said, TJ's a master with found family, and he does such a sublime job in this book. One of the other things TJ excels at is humor. And the Bennett brothers provide some amazing comic relief in this section, including their efforts to help Carter embrace his sexuality and what it might mean to actually, you know, have sex with a man. Some truly priceless moments happen in this part of the book. I cannot overstate that. And then there's the big battle. TJ really pulled out all the stops here. I didn't think things could get any bigger than what went down at the end of Heart Song, but boy, did they ever. I also don't know why I thought I could figure out what TJ was going to do with the end of the book. You may have heard him in conversations that we've had about the book on this show, and he said that not everyone would make it. Now, I had it in my head shortly after the halfway point of the book what I thought that meant, and boy, was I so wrong. I'll admit to be terrified through the battle sequence at the end and the events that unfolded, and TJ made me miss my bedtime one night because I could not stop reading what I was into at the end of the book. Everything that happened, though, made total sense in the context of the series, And ended up, like I said, very satisfying with some truly expert writing from TJ to pull it all together. He also leaves us at the end of the book with what I'll call a little bit of time for recovery. It's not just a matter of the battle being over. There's managing the fallout. And it's not a spoiler for me to say that TJ promised to leave those who were left in a good place. And he really does it. Kurt Graves also has to be mentioned. Kurt burst onto the scene with his incredible narration of Wolf Song, and he delivers on every aspect of Brother Song. I can't really call out where some of his most outstanding moments were, 
because that would you know really be saying too much in the context of the story. But he takes the powerful text that TJ wrote and infuses it with the perfect emotional punch. I'm sad and yet satisfied that Green Creek is over. Thank you, TJ, and thank you, Kurt, for insanely good books and for making these characters part of my life. To say that it was epic and awesome is an understatement. And now we're going to shift gears over to hockey romance, because why wouldn't you go from werewolves to hockey? The Hat Trick series by Avon Gale and Piper Vaughn stands among my very favorite hockey series. The latest and final installment, Trade Deadline, did not disappoint with its amazing second chance romance between a hockey player and a marine biologist. Now, we met Venom Captain Daniel Bellamy in the previous books, and as this one opens, even though the Venom just won the championship at the end of goalie interference, Belty knows that his career is really at a crossroads because of his age. He ends up accepting a trade to his hometown team, the Miami Thunder. The Thunder is at the bottom of the uh, league rankings, and the team really has some major attitude problems, and Thunder management hopes that the Stanley Cup winner could come in and help turn the team around. Now, Micah Kelly and Daniel Bellamy were fast friends in Miami during their childhood. Danny talked of his dreams of hoisting the Stanley Cup, and Micah always wanted to work with fish and be near the ocean. They were also pretty into each other, and and some of their very first making out that they ever did was with each other during sleepovers. Their dreams separated them, though, when Danny left Miami to pursue his hockey career. No one is more surprised with Micah when he finds out that Danny's back in town and playing for Miami. And he decided to turn up at the first Thunder game, even though he is far, far, far from a hockey fan. But it was all worth it because Danny does recognize him in the stands, and they immediately connect after the game to rekindle their friendship, catch up, and start hanging out with each other. Now, a lot has changed over the years, not the least of which is that Danny uh, was married and had kids. And in fact, the, he divorced his wife within the context of the previous books in this series. And Danny hasn't really considered being with a man really since he and Micah, you know, separated when they were kids and life took them down their own paths. But being around Micah is bringing all of those feelings back. And Micah very definitely feels it too, because his former childhood friend has turned out into one hunk of a man. Their tentative romantic reconnection is oh so sweet. Now, I love a sweet book, and this this had sweetness in spades here. Not everything is easy. I mean, Mike has been hurt before, and he's really unsure of offering up his heart again, especially given all that's involved with Danny's career and the travel involved. And, you know, he's got this ex and his kids who are still very much in his life. The career aspect isn't a minor issue either, because the longer the season goes on, the more Danny's not really sure if the Thunder is where he should be. It's a tumultuous, tumultuous situation. As a hockey fan, I really enjoyed this glimpse inside of a team that's not doing well, since many hockey romances involve teams that are at least doing fairly well on the standings, keeping the team mostly on the upbeat side. But here, there's a whole different vibe to it as the team itself is miserable and it's something that Danny's not really used to at all. Avon and Piper have really woven together a perfect tale as Danny and Micah rediscover their friendship and how to be intimate with each other. They have an easygoing and kind of fun approach to their sexy times. It's really different for Danny to approach all, all of this as an adult now, but the vibe that they just fall into seems so natural for them. It was really wonderful to read. Uh, I also appreciated the internal dialogue for both of these characters as the book is in dual POV and how they really fight with themselves over what to do given the external factors in play. You know, for Micah, it's really wondering if Danny can fully give himself over to a man and what it could mean if he has to be traded away again, or just dealing with kind of the miserable state that Danny finds himself in midway through the season. And on the flip side of that, for Danny, he's got everything that is going on with the team and and also coming to terms with himself to understand that he is uh, bisexual. Best of all, these guys know they want to be together and they just have to sort it out. It's not the easiest thing for them to sort it out, but it really, like, the way that it's done was compelling and always felt right and not kind of forced the way that some narratives can be. Good friendships abound in this book. Belzy, of course, has his Venom friends to bounce his feelings off of, and it was really wonderful to get some time with these guys as they ended up visiting in a few different scenarios. 
Micah's got kick-ass friends, too, and in some cases, they give him just the right kind of kick in the butt to get him out of his head. I was so head over heels for how this book resolved for these guys, both personally and professionally. Avon and Piper brought a great closing to this series with Trade Deadline, and I think the grand gesture here was one of my favorites throughout this series. Let's just say that it involved a dolphin. There were so many ways that it could have gone, and the path that Danny chose for his career also showed that he was really looking for a great balance between personal and career needs. I highly recommend this book, which you can read as a standalone, but you might as well pick up the entire series too, because they were all just terrific. Kudos again to Kurt Graves, who also voices this series. I really loved his characterization for Micah in particular, as it just fit Micah so perfectly. Between the excitement over the work that he does with sea lions and dolphins and everything, to his more lusty sides with Danny, it was really great. So if audio is your thing there, you'll definitely want to do the entire series and this book in particular in that format. And since we've been talking about Christmas, yeah, there's a little Christmas in Trade Deadline too, because that book takes place over the hockey season. So of course you get a little Christmas. I am going to break the Christmas tradition now though, because the next two books don't do Christmas at all. And now we're going to take on a historical bent. I do love a good historical, and I've talked about them periodically on the show, and I was very happy to discover Manners and Mannerisms by Tanya Chris. This is my first book that I've read from Tanya, and I'm very glad that I found it because I really enjoyed this story of an American who comes over to England to claim Alban Manor, which he has inherited, and it's an intriguing mix of cultures circa 1788. Lord William Bascom isn't excited about the uh, arrival of Reginald Abernathy once he hears that Reginald is traveling with his sister. As soon as it's announced that they're coming, William's family immediately sets about matchmaking for him, even before they've met their new neighbors. And everyone is very charmed by these Virginians, even as it's clear that there's a distinct difference in the way that the newcomers conduct themselves. It takes some time to get used to their less-than-formal ways. (laughs) Their manners are called breezy, very breezy. And William's all for the breezy because things get often too stuffy with his family, especially as they decide that, in fact, yes, the sister would be a great match for him so that he could end his bachelor ways. Now, from the first time that William meets Reginald, there's very definitely an attraction on William's side. William doesn't really want a wife. He knows he's got a desire for men one that he does everything he can to keep under wraps because he knows the consequences, but it doesn't mean that he wants a marriage. What develops between William and Reginald initially, of course, is a good friendship that both men enjoy, and they do discuss everything from the more mundane things of running an estate, and over time they both reveal that they find it tiresome, the custom of the families actually doing whatever it takes to ensure that a marriage takes place, even if it's not for love. Now, the two also begin to work together at a capacity because Reginald finds some suspicious bookkeeping that's been going on by the gentleman who manages Alban. This little bit of mystery and intrigue as William and Reginald try to figure this stuff out is a really nice way to bring them closer together to work on something that wouldn't necessarily seem suspicious that they were, you know, that somebody was helping out with the books who's actually had some estate management over the course of his life. But, of course, this also means that their proximity allows that attraction to simmer. And boy, does Tanya do an amazing job of just keeping that little thread of this attraction crackling throughout every interaction they have. I really love how Tanya bounces William and Reginald between having this super subtle flirting thing and at times being more overt and even dangerous. It's a delicate game that she balances so very well. And in many ways, you know, Reginald isn't really bound by some of the more uptight consideration of the British. While he knows he needs to tread carefully, that that breeziness, there's that word again, spills over into his attraction for William, and it delightfully throws William way off his game. As they move beyond flirting, Tanya really heats things up, but in a slow burn way. Their first kiss is so sweet and tender and scary as hell for William, especially since there's a knock at the study door right as it happens. And boy, does that first kiss send William into a tizzy trying to figure out what it means and the understanding that he really wants so, so much more out of this relationship. Moving from that first kiss to many, many more to finally having sex really gave me all the feels, especially watching William as he allowed himself to finally want it and to enjoy it. 
the push and pull that he ha- constantly has between what he wants and what his fears are really gave another great crackle of tension to the story that really just pulled me along because I had to know how William was finally going to be able to resolve being able to accept the relationship and fully engage with the happily ever after that he was entitled to. I really loved Reginald in this story too. In, in most of the historicals that I've read, it usually has the two men being from England or somewhere else in Europe, really giving them the same kind of code of conduct. Putting an American in there, even one in, from a very early day in America, with all those less stringent behaviors, really opened up an interesting storyline as these two men were coming at things from a very different point of view, even while being part of the same class. So it presented a very different perspective on things. Reginald, too, is a wonderful character because of how he treats others, uh, especially those in his employment. It's another counterpoint to how staff was often managed in the day where they were usually kept at arm's length. He's a really wonderful character and, and really changes William for the better. And that's a terrific part of the story, watching that unfold. Manners and Mannerisms was a completely enjoyable read, and I'm so glad I picked it up for its wonderful characters. The little bit of intrigue and a very sweet romantic love story. As always, kudos have to go to Joel Leslie on the audiobook. He's always terrific in historicals, and his accent work is always amazing. But I really loved his portrayal of confident Reginald here and the more tumultuous William. He really gave them some great emotional uh, connection in this story. And, you know, having an American thrown into the middle of a bunch of British accents was also really well and let Joel show off his skill all the more. So I really enjoyed Matters and Mannerisms by Tanya Chris. All right, last book. And just as you opened uh, your review segment with a book that might not be something for everyone in this show, I'm going to close out the review segment with a similar one. I love Bill Koenigsberg's books. His titles, which are all young adult, always end up on my favorites list. And his new book, The Bridge, is a departure from the stories that he's told in the past, which have been stories about young people discovering who they are. The Bridge deals with teen mental health and suicide. And Bill really handles this topic with a deft hand that makes this difficult and very emotional topic a compelling read even when the tough gets going. Now, as you can imagine, this book is not going to be for all of you because of its subject matter. But let me tell you a little more about it so you can judge if this outstanding book should be on your TBR. The book centers on teens Aaron and Tilly, who are both feeling suicidal. And Bill presents four different versions of what happens to these two characters. In each version of the story, we see different points of view of what's brought them to this point and the aftermath of their choices. It's a very powerful reading experience, getting into the heads of Aaron and Tilly to see what's pushed them to this breaking point. We become witness to slights by classmates, by family, by teachers. Not always big things, but ones that do pile up over time. There's some huge egregious behavior as well. It's really a wide range of things, large and small, that add up. And Bill does a really incredible job of showing us how people behave towards one another, good and bad, and what the circumstances can be. On the flip side of that, he also shows the small acts and large acts of kindness that can bring people back, too. We get a glimpse of what happens to people who are left behind, pieces they have to pick up. The way that he's managed to tell these four versions of the story really make for an incredible read. It's a, It was a very interesting reading experience that's really hard to piece together, and yet it was something that was a very powerful experience at the same time. Now, I wasn't sure about this book when I decided to read it. I'd had it since it came out a few months ago because I one-click everything by Bill. But these are difficult times we live in, and obviously this book deals with difficult topics. And yet, it didn't bring me into a funk either. Bill made me feel for Aaron and Tilly and their circumstances while giving glimmers of hope everywhere. This book also excels at driving home the fact that we don't know what's going on inside other people's heads and what they may be going through while projecting a happy facade in the world and that we need to really instill kindness all around us and project kindness to others. I'm really glad I read The Bridge. Bill continues to chronicle the teenage experience expertly, and this is an important book, too, as it deals head-on with mental health in such a straightforward manner. It's definitely going to end up on my best of the year list, and I recommend it for someone who thinks this type of story is something for them. And also, since I've talked about audio on each of the reviews that I've done so far in this episode, 
I got to give kudos to Marin Ireland. She does such an incredible job of handling all the characters in this book, and she nails the emotional uh, arc at every single turn. So if audio is for you, you should definitely check it out in this format. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the books that we just discussed, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for this episode, number 267, and that's going to be at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And just a note about all that audio, Brother Song Trade Deadline and The Bridge are all available from Libro.fm. You know we're big fans of them because they allow you to support a local bookstore of your choice anytime you pick up an audiobook. Libro.fm has a very special gift membership offer running through the end of this year. So when you buy a 12-month gift membership, Libro FM will pass along half of the price to the local bookstore of your choice, meaning that bookstores will get $90 for every 12-month gift membership purchased. With independent and local businesses struggling right now, this is a great way to help support them. This offer is only available through December 31st, so act quickly to give the gift of audiobooks to a friend or, hey, even to yourself, and also support a local bookstore at the same time. You can get all the details on this special bundle at biggayfictionpodcast.com slash audio gift. Yeah, I really love Libro.fm. They've got a really amazing selection. Their app is a dream. So simple to use. And this deal that they're doing now on this subscription is really amazing. And I highly recommend everyone check it out. All right, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Now, coming up next in episode 268, we're joined by debut author Liz Farame to talk about her book, Canopy. I am so excited that we have Liz on. Locally here in Sacramento, we've been hearing Liz read from Canopy really since we moved here over two years ago now. And it's really exciting that this book is out. And it was wonderful talking to her about it. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, stay strong, be safe. And above all else, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Our original theme music is composed by Daryl Banner. Thank you.